It's the Agribusiness Report. I'm Tony St. James, and we're joined today by the Honorable Kelly Armstrong, representing the state of North Dakota, member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Ethics Committee, and Climate Crisis. Did I get all the committee assignments in there? You did. Okay. Welcome, and it's good to, good to see you. I thought about you last night, though, as the, the rain started rolling through D.C. and just wondering, is it still dry back home? It is. Uh, we got very little snow in North Dakota, which is unusual for North Dakota. And I think according to the latest drought monitor, 90% of our, 99% of our state is in a drought. Then places that really needed rain didn't need the 10 inches they got in two hours last week. So as is all things, it's frustrating because commodity prices are obviously started to rebound doing well. And now we have a lot of people from one end of the state to the other just uh, in some real drought conditions that are uh, devastating for towns and communities. And it's affecting, obviously, row crop producers, but also having, a, I would say, probably a devastating effect on your livestock producers. Absolutely. I mean, that, last week there were 1,200 pairs sold at auction, and by the end of that, I mean, you can imagine how it was. All the buyers were gone, but they just don't have it. I mean, when the grass is crunching under your feet in the beginning of June, you just simply don't have anywhere to put the cows. So uh, Senator Hovind, Senator Kramer, and I are leading a letter to allow for early haying of CRP uh, prior to August 1st, which, is, which will be helpful. But, I mean, nothing helps like rain. We need rain. Um, you know, some of our row crops, if they don't, if they didn't get it last week, are probably already. I mean, your spring wheat, your, I mean, in those types of areas, are probably already in a little trouble. But pasture can come back if we can get more rain, and uh, hopefully, people can take care of it. I, I would just say, I think one thing people forget that don't, particularly in the livestock industry, is. I think too many people that aren't involved in it think, you know, one day you can walk in and you sell half your herd and then the next year you'll just buy, your, buy half your herd back. And they, I mean, one, insurance is incredibly expensive. And two, a lot of these ranchers have spent years, if not decades, getting their herds to where they want them. And, under, and you have these really, when you have these really dry years, it just devastates the operation. And supplemental feeding is not the way to go. That just doesn't fizzle out. Let's talk about that issue that you you mentioned, you get 10 inches of rain in just a few hours and it causes, it, it just doesn't give it time to soak in, which means it becomes a water of the U.S. <laughs> in a way. Well, if, if, you would, if you would listen to the last administration, every puddle would be a water of the U.S. and indeed under the most draconian reading of the WOTUS ruling, 86% of North Dakota would be federally regulated, which is just unacceptable and untenable for producing, producing states. Uh, our Attorney General, Wayne Stedgem, got an injunction in 2015 on the original WOTUS, uh, rule, or original WOTUS rule. That injunction is still in place. That, that has never been lost, uh, so we really appreciate that. But now as this new administration is talking about opening up WOTUS again, obviously we're gonna, I mean, we're gonna have real pause for concern. We have the Little Missouri River, we have the Missouri River, we have Lake Sakakawea, we have the Red River in the east, we know what navigable waters are. But a dry creek bed north of Belfield is not a navigable water and the federal government has no business regulating it. Another area, and I'll try to work back over to the livestock issue now, uh, one of the other challenges, take away the drought, uh, has been the realization of consolidation in the beef packing industry. What have you been watching there? So I'm on energy and commerce now, and so we, we continue to deal with that in consumer protection. But where we really tried to attack it from a different place than you usually see is I was on the antitrust sub, subcommittee of judiciary last year. And I, think, I don't think there's any doubt that there is consolidation to the point that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, we had a fire at a Kansas plant and prices spiked. I mean, it was like, I think a quarter of the plant was shut down. But the real problem with that is, uh, and we'll talk about COVID a little bit too, the prices spiked everywhere and consumers were paying more, but producers weren't seeing that income. It's all in that bottleneck of basically four processors that own all of the facilities. And so we've been trying to get creative on some of this, barriers to entry, smaller processors, local processors, things we can uh, do to source that and allow for more competition in the market. And that's before you get into Brazil imports. And, you know, um, cool is obviously something we hear a lot about, but I mean, the real issue, and I think the thing we can do after our, you know, 
Uh, USMCA was negotiated, which makes cool, cool legislation real problematic moving forward. But what we can do is deal with the processing and the packaging and the ways in which people game their way around the system under the current rules. And we saw that with Brazil. And we need, we need to protect our local producers. Uh, we, we grow the best beef in the world. It's the healthiest beef in the world. And it, it, it's not just a matter of a couple of cattle ranchers in western North Dakota, right? Does it, the entire communities depend on that. And it's a way of life, and we appreciate it. Some would say that it takes Congress is a lot like a, a, a huge ship trying to turn quickly in the sea. You just don't get things, can't get things done quickly because there are so many different ideas that come in. Is this uh, the markets issue and some of these issues that are uh, livestock producers are dealing with? Are there quick fixes there, or is this something that could take a while? Well, we've been, I, I mean, so I've only been here since 2018, and about every 10 days or so, we always tickle the DOJ, regardless of which administration, of where they're at on some of their antitrust enforcements and that, right? But right, antitrust enforcement's an executive branch function. What Congress can do, and I think the two things that we could do well, is one, promote policy and legislation that, in, that lowers those um, barriers to market, whether it's overtime for USDA regulators, different types of things like that. And then states like Wyoming have already started doing some of these things. They're just going around. The more we can give states primacy, the better we're going to be because states actually can, I mean, state governments don't adapt quickly either, but they adapt significantly quicker than the federal government. So if we can create those, uh, reduce those barriers in entry and create more competition, that will always increase prices. And we've seen that, right? Not just, not just from the normal problems, but over COVID and supply chain issues. We just had a cyber hack on one of our processors that, I mean, essentially shut them down in the United States. These aren't just issues to make sure that our producers are getting a fair price and that our consumers aren't getting gouged, but it actually does matter. North Dakota is one of the reasons the United States is both food and energy secure. I always say we feed and fuel the world. Let us do it. Just let us do it. Final one for you, just uh, about a minute left. If there were, I mean, obviously we've talked about high priority issues for you, but if there were a couple of things you could see accomplished here in the next, uh, in this session, or, or in the next five years, I mean, is there something that you really want to see happen here in Congress? Um, yeah, I'll say, well, one, we're starting work on the Farm Bill already. We know how that works. It comes around making sure that we are doing an adequate job of protecting, you know, crop insurance, supple, supplemental crop insurance. As I often tell people, I'm on the Climate Crisis Committee, and I say what other members of that committee call climate, climate crisis, we usually call Tuesday in North Dakota. And so that, on the good side, on the bad side, is ensuring that waters of the United States, opening up Section 401 of the Clean Water Act, making sure that we allow North Dakota producers to be in charge of their lives and not the federal government. So on the positive note, working towards the good policies that affect North Dakota, North Dakota's ag economy, and on the negative note, making sure we're pushing back against bad regulation, which is usually written by people that have never had dirt under their fingernails in their life. It doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're, they're trying to hurt communities in North Dakota, but it, their worldview just doesn't, doesn't equate to what we do out there. And so the more I can let North Dakotans be in charge of North Dakota policy, the better off we're gonna be. So good to see you. Wish you the best. Come back and see us. Thanks. Again, it's the Honorable Kelly Armstrong representing the state of North Dakota, member of the Climate Crisis, Energy and Commerce, and Ethics Committees on today's Agribusiness Report.